In this lecture, we are going to be looking at the cultural meaning of clothing. And it's interesting because human beings are actually the only living creatures that wear clothing for both functional and symbolic reasons. Other creatures may technically wear clothes, but they don't do it by choice. It's their humans putting clothes on them. So first, let's talk about functional. Functional means it has a practical use. A functional use of, use of clothing is to protect the body from wear. So think about your footwear, right? When you're going to go running, you're going to go hiking, you, you choose different types of shoe to protect your feet. Um, they're also there to protect us from cold, heat, abrasion, or even physical harm. Think protective uniforms. Also, functional purposes could be to conform to the needs of the human body at different stages of growth and development throughout our lives. Think, you know, diapers for babies, loose clothing for the elderly, maternity clothes and nursing garments for pregnant and nursing mothers. All of those have a specific function for the clothing. Yet we also wear clothing that is symbolic. And by this, we mean that it communicates cultural meaning in some sort of symbolic way. Usually, there is an immediate understanding for those who have literacy in the society's cultural language, meaning if you understand the culture, you understand the significance of the clothing. This symbolic clothing communicates something about the wearer's identity or social role or status to the world at large and distinguishes between one society and the other. Now, at this point, I want you to pause the video, and you'll have to go to the posted slides of the lecture, and I want you to watch this short YouTube uh, video. This is a TED Talk by Jennifer Millspaw, and it's about how clothing impact, impacts your life. And what she's going to talk about here is she's going to talk about reflection of the importance and value that both clothing and fashion has. And I want you to pay distinct uh, attention. Number one, pay attention to how... Um, she's often dismissed because fashion is her uh, research topic. But look at how she forms her argument to show how important fashion and clothing actually is to our lives. And I want you to distinctly pay attention to, she's going to claim that fashion signifies two distinct things. And you need to know what these are. Um, and you also then need to think about how and why fashion and clothing affects your own life. Okay, moving on. Hopefully you've already watched the, the video. Um, clothing was originally designed as a way, again, to protect ourselves from the cold and other elements. Since that time period, clothes have developed not only to become an extension of our personalities, but also as a status symbol. Every country or region has different characteristics that form an identity, and what we can see from this identity is it is distinctive from other other cultures. Clothing can function as a communication tool for identity, customs, and individual nature of its use. And then a person's dress style is influenced by many things. Think about it. when you got up and got dressed today, how and why did you decide to put on what you did? Maybe you had to go to a certain area. Maybe you were going to go, you know, to campus and you were going to see other people on campus. Maybe you get to work from home today, so in your, you're in your comfy pants. Maybe you have to go to your job later or you're going to see, you know, your family members later. Uh, the weather probably had something to do with it. Um, recently, when I'm recording this lecture, it just recently got very cold. So we start dressing, you know, with layers, with coats. So think about how and why you got dressed and why you put on what you did today. Many things can shape our style, and these include culture, values inherited by the community groups, as well as family, envir environment, media, fashion trends, and personal character. All of these give reference to how, dress and shape, uh, how we dress and shape for our preferences. In the simplest sense, we mean by cultural identity, this is a breakdown of characteristics of a culture that is owned by a group of people, and we know the limits when compared to other characteristics of other cultures. The clothes worn by someone often has hidden meanings and messages, and even clothes no longer function as protectors, but just to show social status in society or personal expression. If you look at the traditions and customs of different regions, you can also know that clothing and its use is growing. 
namely clothing that is used for everyday activities and clothing that is worn on certain events. These are complete with veiled messages of the clothing. So think about that. You know, what you wear every day, when you have special events, special occasions, we usually consider it dressing up. Maybe it's more formal. Maybe it's a specific uniform. Um, probably one of the most popular examples of this is the wedding dress, and that's the image I have on the upper left. In the Western world, there is now the tradition, right, that the brides wear a white dress. And many of us believe that that white dress was to resemble purity. Well, that is true in a sense, but what's interesting is this was not always the way. Um, when we look at a historical bride's dress, they didn't always wear white down the aisle. In fact, back in the 17 and 1800s, White was actually associated with mourning, and no bride wants to be reminded of grief on their wedding day, unless they're trying to make a very specific message. Now, there were some daring brides, like Mary the Queen of Scots in 1558, who made a bold fashion statement by wearing white, but it was certainly not the color most brides preferred. Instead, in early church weddings, brides were most likely to wear, brace yourself, they were most likely to wear red when they got married. Wealthy brides, many from the aristocracy, would have jewel toned dresses edged in fur and embroidered in gold and silver to make a splash and to show how wealthy their family was. Um, there is a story about Margaret of York from 1468 that they tried to show how wealthy her family was that when she tried to walk into the church in her wedding dress, it was so laden with the family jewels, the heirloom jewels, uh, that she actually had to be carried into the church because it was too heavy for her to even move. So dresses were often displays of wealth, brilliantly colored, and decorated to the extreme. Now, when did this change? This all changed with Queen Victoria. When Victoria was getting married to Prince Albert in 1840, she was just 20 years old. And she wanted her subjects to know that she took the job of being queen very seriously. And so she wanted to show that she was both prudent and sensible. So she decided the best way to convey that message was through a sensible and prudent wedding gown. So when she steps out of the carriage at St. James Palace, she stunned the world by wearing a simple white gown. And that's actually the gown you see here. It was made of white spun silk and satin with lace accents, and her head was topped with a wreath of orange blossoms and myrtle instead of a crown or tiara. Now, she had very good reasons for these choices. Again, she wanted to show that she was being sensible and prudent, that she would not spend England's money on a lavish wedding. Also, she only wore British-made materials. Interestingly enough, this was actually repeated by Kate Middleton in, in the uh, recent royal wedding. Uh, Victoria wanted to give attention to the lace industry in the town of Bear, Devon, which had been on the decline. And so she thought the white dress would best highlight the delicate lace work. So she's bring, trying to bring attention to a specific town that was in an economic hardship. Also, another reason was less pragmatic and more romantic. She wanted to marry Prince Albert not as the queen, but as a woman who loved him. And so the dress did that by reflecting her purity, innocence, and good sense. So you see her choosing of this white dress had two different reasons. Another standard, um, in, in 1849, in Godey's Ladies Book, um, this basically was considered the vogue of the Victorian world. You would go there to see what was in fashion. Well, it was stated that white is the most fitting hue for brides to wear, noting that it is, quote, an emblem of purity and innocence of girlhood and the unsullied heart she now yields to the chosen one, unquote. So now you can see, thanks to Queen Victoria and the ladies' book, that is now why white has become the go-to choice for brides on their wedding days. Um, the other image I have up on this slide refers again to choosing what we wear. Um, and this refers to first impressions. First impressions are relatively long-lasting in our society, and even glasses can influence other people's perception of usage, right? There's this common idea that, well, somebody who's wearing glasses must be smart. Um, sometimes we dress to impress others, to be more like them, 
or we wear clothes that are contrary to the norms and held by a group of people to express our rejection of their values. So the first impression I'm showing here, this is probably somebody going for a job interview. And while he looks okay in both images, right, the image on the left, he's a little sloppy, not quite as put together as the image on the right. And something as quick as this first impression based on what you're wearing um, can change how people perceive you. What's interesting also, clothing is a part of unity that cannot be separated from our social life. Think about different fashions and styles. In the personal dimension, clothing becomes a medium to explore expressions and ideas that sometimes appear in abstract forms. Through sociocultural dimension, clothing is used both as a medium of communication, promotion, and even the formation of ideology and rebellion. Clothing products um, work as a visual manifestation of cultural products and are often used as markers for social identities of social community. Now in the article I have you read, I also thought there was an interesting example where they talk about this idea called dress ethics. So dress ethics is often, it's, interp it's interpreted as a reflection of ourselves through the clothing that is worn. So take for example, if I said, all right, go find on on the, on the internet somewhere. Go find me of someone who is dressed uh, in a polite and good way and show me somebody who is dressed in a not so good or a bad way. And what's interesting is we could probably all go look at something and most of our imagers are probably going to be close. But what's interesting, this idea of dress ethics is we're not just saying, oh, this person is dressed good this person is dressed bad, but we also then take that as a judgment on the person, that if you're dressed this way, you must be a good person, and if you're dressed the other way, you must be a bad person, have meaning have bad ethics. And think back to a couple weeks ago, where we did the biases and the stereotype lecture, and think how much clothing, right, what a person was wearing, influenced how you judged them. All right. So we are going to be looking, continuing looking at clothing as cultural diversity and that we're, this should be taken into account. Clothing is an expression, image, and personality of a culture. Because clothing can be reflected the norms of cultures and values of a nation, clothing can also be seen as inseparable from society. And we're going to see different ways that it is influenced by it. Now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at five ways uh, com that clothing has a way of communicating. Uh, then these two slides, I'm just going to read them and then we're going to go through them in more detail. So clothing is a reflection of a society or cultural context in an era of its creation. So it can be a reflection of a society as a whole. Within an individual society, it can be an indicator of class, rank, occupation, status, and gender role. Within an individual society, it can distinguish between the majority and the other. It can also project our individual identity to the outside world. And last, it can be an overt political statement to the outside world. So let's look at each of these five individually. So first, right, the cultural meaning of clothing Clothing, its style, and the cloth it is made of reflects the society, cultural context, and era of its creation. And so we're going to go through some different examples, such as the sari, the kilt, the baumeliki, elephant masks, and then finally, <clears throat> excuse me, the kimono. All right, so the sari, which is what you see imaged here. The sari, often spelled S-A-R-E-E. -E, this is a garment traditionally worn in India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Though mostly worn by women in modern fashion, the sari is actually a unisex piece of clothing. It can be an heirloom passed down through generations or a purely functional garment worn every day. Traditionally, the sari has been defined as a single piece of unstitched fabric often with heavier sections to allow it to drape correctly. Its border, which is much like a hem, would be woven with a heavier density as it would, and so it would pull the piece down. That way, you know, it gives it some weight. Today, the term has evolved to become inclusive of contemporary materials, including cotton, silk, synthetic fiber, and more. Uh, next is the kilt. 
A kilt is a knee-length skirt-like garment with pleats at the back, and this originated in traditional dress of Gaelic men and boys in the Scottish Highlands. Its first wear was recorded in the 16th century and as the great kilt. Eventually, smaller and more modern kilts emerged in the 18th century. And what's interesting, it's only since the 19th century that the kilt has actually become associated with the wider culture of Scotland and more broadly, all of Gaelic culture. Remember, it was originally just part of the Scottish Highlands. Often the kilt is worn at formal occasions and sports events. Kilts are often made of woolen cloth and a tartan pattern, which we would liken to a plaid. While nowadays it's up to the individual wearer which colors and patterns they wear, in the mid-19th century, many patterns were created and artificially associated with Scottish clans, families, or institutions who had Scottish heritage. So when you go to, you know, the Renaissance Fair and they're like, oh, look up your family's kilt, um, this actually did not, the patterns being associated with specific clans, didn't happen until the mid-19th century. All right, next is the image in the upper right, and this is what's called a Bamiliki elephant mask. And what this happens is Cameroon warriors who rendered a great service to the Bamaliki king were eligible to be members of the Aka, a.k.a. or the Elephant Mask Society. They danced at the funeral of the king in twice yearly meetings wearing dramatic hacks and elaborately beaded elephant masks. They also danced. So this was a social status, right? Only these warriors who had rendered a great service to the king were even allowed to be a part of this, um, this society, if you will. These costumes belonged to the king, and they displayed his wealth, power, and privilege. The influx of tiny pound beans, they were called, beads, I'm sorry, they were called this because they were sold by the pound in a limitless range of colors and regular shapes. Um, they were traded into Central Africa, and then it enabled the development of new motifs of sculptural beadwork, incorporating symbolic animal and plant designs. So you can look at the different elephant masks, and they are very elaborate, and they are all are different, but usually these designs have some sort of cultural meaning. And then last, we're going to look at the kimono. We're going to spend a little bit more time on this. The kimono is often associated as the national dress of Japan. The word kimono simply means object of wear. And originally, the word did not refer to a specific style of garment. During the Meiji period, um, during the Meiji Emperor's reign, 1868 to 1912, the traditional garment of the elite urban dweller, meaning the upper, the urban upper class, those who lived in the cities, these, be call, these were called kodoso, K-O-S-O-D-E. They became identified as a true form of Japanese national dress. From this period on, the kimono became the form of Japanese national dress in exclusion of all other traditional styles. So the kimono itself is also not even that old. We're also going to see it's a cultural self-distinction in response to the West. Uh, the emergence of the kimono is an excellent example of how dress is used by a group to distinguish itself from others. Remember, we talked about this actually last week. It was mentioned um, in the episode of Encounters that Japan had been isolated from the Western influence for several centuries before the Meiji period. Remember, this is where literally they shut their borders down for 200 years the only people that were allowed to live there were the Dutch traders, and in fact, they were off on their own island. Well, what happens is the Meiji Emperor opened the gates of Japan to Western trade, causing an influx of Westerners, Western material goods, and clothing styles. Many of the Japanese began to wear the Western-style clothing of the late Victorian and, Ed and Edwardian periods. The shock of constant occasioned by seeing the dress of the outlandish West forced Japanese to identify with what they themselves really wore. So all of a sudden they're being confronted with all of this Western influence, and so it forced the Japanese to take a look at what they themselves actually wear traditionally. Uh, the cultural symbolism of the kimono. Although all kimono are generally made the same way, differences in color, sleeve length, and cut and um, emblems symbolize minute differences in rank, gender, age, and social status. And you can see this on this slide, uh, the bottom right, where look at the sleeve. And you can tell just by the length of the sleeve uh, whose kimono it is. 
The basic cut and structure of the kimono, it's basically a wraparound robe that it's held in place with what's called an obi, O-B-I, or a belt in a contrasting fabric. Kimonos are cut from a single length of fabric that are woven specifically for the kimono, using all the fabric with no waste. A bolt of such fabric is approximately 13 yards in length and 14 inches wide. The designs on fine ceremonial or dress kimono are often hand painted by artists on the fabric. Shopping for kimono and assembling a kimono wardrobe is the antithesis of Western culture. Okay, Western culture, we tend to buy things and then simply throw them away when we're done. However, a kimono wardrobe is assembled over one's lifetime, piece by piece. Kimono are never discarded as new ones are added to the wardrobe collection. Kimono are bought as fabric by the bolt, bolt with the selection of fabric for contrasting obi, meaning it does not match. Um, J Japanese never buy kimono used, although antique kimonos are sold in shop, but only foreigners buy them. The high price of a kimono displays its permanency as part of an individual wardrobe. And the cost of a contemporary haute couture kimono is described here, this meaning it's the high fashion. So a woman's long sleeve furrow sewed kimono in shades of pale green and pink silk crepe with embroidered fans scattered on it costs $5,850. The obai is black silk brocade with gold, silver, red, and blue designs of cranes, drums, chrysanthemums, and other objects. And the obai was $5,175. So showing you, right, a kimono in the highest fashion is a $10,000 purchase. A less formal visiting wear kimono is somewhat less expensive, but still pricey. For example, a silver gray satin kimono fading to a peach with a hand painted design of stylized floral, floral sprays reaching to the shoulder is $2,625. A salmon covered heavy silk obi with abstract floral design composed of a combination of hand dyeing and gold embroidery would cost $3,375. So showing you how expensive these purchases are and why they remain in the wardrobe. So last, who wears a kimono? Stereotypically, we think of kimono as a woman's dress. However, men, women, and children can all wear kimonos. Um, very recently, we've seen the resurgence of kimono as a hip form of, hip form of Japanese dress in both Japan and globally. And think about how the kimono, right, the, the idea and the style of the kimono has been adopted into other cultures, right? In the United States, you're going to see, you know, kimono-inspired dress, uh, kimono-inspired shirts, often in women's wear. All right, let's move on to number two. Within an individual society, clothing is a symbolic indicator of the following. Class, rank, occupation, status, and gender roles. And so here I put a collection of images. So take a moment and look at them. So in the top left, we have two UPS workers. How do we know they're UPS workers? Because of the uniform, right? This shows the occupation. In fact, UPS is very, very proud of its brown uniforms and its brown trucks. In fact, one of their slogans is, what can brown do for you? So this is a way of showing occupation. We can look at the UPS worker, uh, the, the deliverer, right, the male or female, and we know exactly who they are and who they work for. Um, UPS is actually very particular in the uniform, right? You can't just wear anything brown. It has to be in a specific way because it easily identifies the person as being associated with the UPS. Um, the image on the right, right, this is showing different rank. These are different examples of army uniforms. And if you are knowledgeable in this, right, you could look at the cut, the style, the color, um, the badges, the adornments, the hats, and this helps to tell us what the different ranks are. And we talk about clothing, right? We're not just talking about, you know, shirts, pants, dresses. We are talking also about the accessories that go along with it. Uh, next, gender roles. Here's two different images that show gender roles. The first is the high heels. 
Um, high heels were designed, right? They're actually why women wear them is because when they do, it changes their posture and actually makes the bust um, the bust and the, um, the butt more prominent and therefore it's seen as more pleasing to the male gaze. And then the bikini, right? The bikini is pretty much a status symbol of the female form. Now, do we see males sometimes wearing high heels and bikinis? We do, but often that is trying to challenge that status quo. And then the last image we have here is the Gucci jacket. Okay, um, this is with Gucci signature double G uh, design, and this is to show class and or status. So what happens with this Gucci jacket, it is actually very expensive. This jacket, it's a men's jacket, costs $1,980. And so by wearing this out in public, right, obviously it's decorated with the symbol of Gucci, right? Gucci is a high, high dollar item, high class. By wearing this, you are literally showing people um, your wealth and your status. All right, moving on to the third. This is where within an individualized society, clothing can distinguish between the majority and the other of, by symbolizing religious, social, and or ethnic differences. And here I only have one image because I think it's a very stark reminder. And what we see here, this is a picture that was taken during World War II um, in Germany, in Nazi Germany. And this is where the Jews were forced to wear a Star of David very prominently displayed on their clothing. Why? It showed that they were, of, they were either of the Jewish religion or they were considered Jews. Because you have to remember during this time period that not just those of the Jewish faith, were labeled as Jews. It was basically anybody who did not conform to the standards of the Nazi party. They were deemed to be Jewish and therefore degenerate, making them this other. Usually when we are othering people, it is in a very negative way. We're saying they're somehow different from the majority and this difference is not good. All right, next. Clothing projects, projects our individual identity to the outside world and generates self-definition by telling the world around us who we are. And we're going to look at a couple different examples here. The first, we're going to look at the gentleman in the top right. Now, this is Mark Bryan. He's an American robotics engineer who lives in Germany. And he has gotten a lot of press recently because he wears high heels and skirts every day to prove that clothing has no gender. He is a married father of three, and he says he wears these because he can. He says, I am just a straight, happily married guy that loves Porsches, beautiful women, and incorporating high heels and skirts into my daily wardrobe. He said his daily wardrobe includes red pumps, plaid mini skirts, and seasonally appropriate suede boots, which he often pairs with sensible mid-calf beige pencil skirt. He says, I prefer skirts to dresses. Dresses don't allow me to mix the genders. I prefer a masculine look above the waist and a non-gendered look below the waist. And so for him, he's trying to say, you know, he's trying to challenge that high heels and dresses are only women's wear. That, in fact, clothing can, is non-gendered and you can wear what you want. He says that his choices are for non-sexual reasons. He said the habit began in college with an old flame. The two would often practice dancing together, both in high heels, and then it quickly became the norm for him. And he compares his experience of teetering around in public on these heels to having green hair. He says, you look up and see this person, or your mind tells you it's a person with green hair, and you think to yourself, huh, that's odd or interesting. Then you go back to what you were doing and don't give it another thought. Okay. So for him, it's not, it's a statement, but it's not a statement challenging, you know, gender identity or anything. He is trying to say that clothing, right, you should be able to wear what you want. And that just because you're male or female, it should not matter. All right. The second way we're going to look at this is by looking at punk music and punk movement as a form of rebellion. And here you see the image of the Ramones. And then this is also where after we discuss this section, I would like you to go back and watch this YouTube clip um, where it's talking about how... Um, Get down, sorry. It's talking about how the punk movement has actually been commercialized. 
So what happened? Punk is more than just a sound. It's a way, it's a whole way of being, and it was rock's new rebels. Um, they preferred and lit, they performed and lived in t-shirts and Levi's jeans. So music has only ever been just one faucet of punk's identity. It's more than just a sound, it's a whole way of being. It's a philosophy, an attitude, and more importantly for us, a look. Punk sonic foundations were laid down in New York City by the same people who established the beginnings of punk style. Artists like Lou Reed, The Ramones, Suicide, and the New York Dolls. What they wanted is they wanted to strip away the bloat that rock had accumulated in the psychedelic era and return it to something pure. So why Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones matched their arena-filling ambitions with equally elaborate costumes of velvet and sequins, rock's new rebels preferred live-in t-shirts and Levi's. In the mid-1970s, the New York sound and style came into focus through the Ramones, who created a uniform of shredded Levi's 505 jeans and black leather jackets. And again, that's who you see imaged here. Television, whose guitarist Richard Hell was one of the first performers uh, in rock to spike his hair, and torn t-shirts held together by safety pins. And Blondie, Blondie fronted by Debbie Harry, who pioneered high-low mixes of Levi's and designer pieces, and other groups that then or orbited the divey clubs like CBGB. They had no money. The holes in Joey's knees were from wear and tear. They were not fashion, meaning Joey Ramone. Um, I have photos of Dee Dee Ramone. This is from photographer Jenny Lenz. She says, I have photo photos of Dee Dee Ramone wearing a leather jacket and around the wrist it's really frayed. It was shameful back then to run around with holes in your jeans and the Ramones said, F that, that's who we are. By the time people started calling it punk, the revolution had already started to spread around the globe. Malcolm McLaren, who managed the New York Dolls before returning to London, where he partnered with designer Vivian Westwood, they operated a boutique called Sex. Inspired by what he saw in New York, he combined the dolls' over-the-top outrageousness with Richard Hell's deconstructed style to create a quintessential British spin on punk fashion and tapped his new clients, the Sex Pest Pistols, to promote it. McLaren went back to England and emulated the look and gave it a little more pizzazz, with hair color and putting more fashion into it. At the same time, other London punks like X-Ray Specs um, seized upon the moment's DIY, do-it-yourself philosophy, and started using staple items like jeans and leather jackets as blank canvases to decorate with pins, paint, and spikes. And so what happens with the punk movement, right, that it wasn't just a music movement, but punk became and is still known as a way and means of rebelling. And that to be associated with punk um, was to be dressed in the punk fashion, which originally, right, was just very, very casual. The fashion was very organic. There were no paid stylists. And the artists claimed that they were each stylists for each other. Everyone was going to thrift stores together, going to bazaars together, sharing each other's clothing. It really came out of dressing up every day and expressing yourself in being an artist. You could be an artist who expressed themselves visually from head to toe, also on stage, or not. You could be a photographer or a graphic artist or a fan or whatever, but you were identified as part of this movement by how you dress. In fashion, its influence has spread even further. Sorry, my dog has her squeaky toy. You can see some of uh, X's rootsy simplicity in the indie rock uniform of jeans and t-shirts, and the continuing influence of McLaren and Vivian Westwood's vision in complexly customized jackets that have become de rigueur for rap stars. Punk style's most enduring legacy can't be boiled down to a particular item of clothing or even the popularity of distressed jeans and dyed hair. It's more about the idea of being authentic, that if you do your own thing and dress your own way, you can make the world change around you. Uh, Lynn said, we would take what we would see in fashion and make it our own, where other people would take what's fashion and just run with it. We influence fashion more than, than the other way around. And so what you see here, right, is how punk didn't originally intend to be a fashion statement or a movement, but it turned into that. It turned into a form of rebellion. 
What's interesting, you can still go out and buy a Ramones t-shirt today. And that's why I want you to watch this YouTube video. It's going to look at some of the original punk uh, bands. Um, I will warn you, some of it does get explicit. But then it talks about how, right, this was a form never meant to be a style, but then it became a style. It was supposed to be a rebellion. And then it's going to talk about how, you know, commercialized it's actually become today. You can go into a store like Hot Topic and buy a Ramones and a Sex Pistols t-shirt. All right, next, um, we're going to look at Billy Porter. Billy Porter, uh, 50 years old at the time of this recording, he is a Broadway veteran, and he has three decades as a professional writer, actor, and a singer under his belt. Um, he w became pretty well known in the last couple years for his role in Kinky Boots on Broadway. And then since 2018, he's been a star on the TV series Pose. So what happens with um, Billy Porter is that he started to be known for his red carpet outfits. In fact, it was an outfit first that he wore for the Golden Globes. He wore a suit that was pretty, you know, pretty normal. It was a nice suit. But then he also wore this elaborate um, satin line embroidered cape. And he said for him, he said, that Globes outfit changed everything for me. I had to cur the courage to then push the status quo. Then came the Oscars um, the, on the night of the 91st Academy Awards. Porter rocked, rocked up dressed in a velvet tuxedo jacket and sweeping ball gown from designer Christian, Christian Siriano and a pair of six-inch Rick Owen boots. And that's the image in the top right. He literally stole the show. Right. Porter was there to host the red carpet uh, coverage ahead of the ceremony, but his look was the only one anyone wanted to talk about. And it was the one that you saw um, all over the media and social media. Nearly every media outlet covered the outfit. A New Yorker piece by Rachel Smead read, quote, Billy Porter won the Oscars red carpet before it even began, unquote. Social media went into a frenzy. Add did the as did the awards show circuit awards show circuit that's not easy to say. Keen to see what Porter would come up with next, and that's almost become a thing. Like, what's he gonna wear next? Uh, he sensationalized at the Met Gala in May. That's the uh, image on the bottom right. Here he made an entrance carried on a gold placon. That's where he's like on the little couch, and he was carried by six shirtless men. And he's wearing a gold bodysuit by the Blondes and custom gold shoes by Giuseppe Zanotti. The list could go on and on. Uh, Porter has never failed to deliver on red carpet style. And more than that, he showed us how fun, outrageous, and above all, meaningful dressing for the occasion can be. He says from the very start of his red carpet ascent, the 50-year-old actor has been forthcoming about his use of clothes. Fabulous, loud, fluid, and larger than life. He uses these clothes as a tool to subvert stereotypes and ignite discussions about identity, gender norms, and non-conforming representation. He says, I am not a drag queen. I am a man in a dress. He said this of his Oscars look in the same Vogue essay, which, which he professed how the Golden Globes cape had become his catalyst for change. He said, from this moment, meaning the Oscars, I want people to understand that you don't have to understand or even agree with other people's authenticity or truths. But we all must respect each other. People are going to be really uncomfortable with my black ass in a ball gown. But it's not anybody's business but mine. Through fashion, he's embarked onto a journey of liberation and asked us to follow along with him. Both in interviews and on social media, he's expressed not just his deep love for couture, but also messages of tolerance, acceptance, and breaking free from any constraint around which defines, quote, being a man, unquote, today. He said women are allowed to, to be masculine, and that's considered strong and powerful. But when men wear dresses, it's a thing. I'm over that. We need to shatter that stereotype. Putting on these heels without apologies makes me feel the most masculine I've ever felt, and that's the truth. That's the conversation I'm trying to have. 
His outfits have also been openly political. Uh, the Celestino Couture dress suit he wore to the Tony Awards, that's on the left. This was designed to represent, uh, to resemble a uterus and to draw attention to reproductive rights at a time when the topic is all the more relevant in America. The Met Ball Sun Goddess symbol, again, the lower right, uh, celebrated camp. That was the Gallus theme. And he saw camp as one of the highest forms of fashion and art. And so what we see in this, right, is that he, again, is literally using his clothing to show his individual identity to the world. And it's also going to transition into the fifth one here. He's also using it to make an overt political statement to the outside world. And that's what we're going to see in the fifth means here. So again, clothing can be an overt, which means open and obvious, political statement to the outside world, proclaiming our political allegiances often against those of the status quo. Memory said often. So I've got three different images here. The one on the top left, this is a MAGA hat, right? Make America great again. When somebody is wearing this hat, Right? They are showing alliance with the core beliefs of a specific political group. When somebody's wearing this hat, right, we can look at them and we distinctly know what political party they are affiliated with. The middle image is the pride rainbow t-shirt. Um, the rainbow is often a symbol of um, acceptance or membership in the uh, LGBTQ community. However, when we also put it with the word pride, right, it adds another level to it. And so this shirt, right, is showing acceptance or membership with this specific community. And then the last piece we have here, this is something that's become very interesting in today's culture. And this is the hijab. Yes, this does have a religious meaning, and the religious meaning does show membership in a specific religious group, meaning Muslim. However, recently, and especially in the West, it has become more of a political symbol. Um, basically, it's saying that in an anti-Islamic society, it is okay to be Muslim. So somebody wearing this would be, I am a Muslim woman, and that is nothing, not anything I should be ashamed of. Also, this could be a political statement that being a Muslim woman is not a tool of oppression or sexism. Uh, there is this idea that all women within the faith are being oppressed and that it is a faith that is distinctly discriminatory, and that's not necessarily true. So this idea, right, of a female wearing this is to say, look, I am not an oppressed woman. This is a symbol of my religion and my faith, and it is perfectly acceptable for me to be wearing this. All right, so I want you to think about that. Please definitely do watch the two YouTube videos that are embedded in the lecture slides. I promise you, you will be asked about them at some point. But hopefully this helps you see the importance that clothing has and the messages it has. Maybe next time when you go to get dressed, right, you might actually stop and think about why you're putting on what you're putting on.